Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, depending on where you're coming from. Thanks for joining us for graduate student podcasting as part of the Humanities Podcast Network Symposium in 2022. This is our second symposium. And if you've been enjoying what you have heard here, you can check out our YouTube page where we have all the recordings of our prior symposium, which is also linked on our website. So check it out. Um, we are gonna get rolling and we may have a third talking head joining us um, in the middle, but we will just roll with that because actually that kind of fits with the uh, atmosphere of this panel that we'd imagined, which was very conversational. And um, we're really looking forward to talking with those of you who are in the room as well and, you know, finding out about your podcasts or your interests and what brought you to this Zoom room on this Saturday, because one of the really exciting things about podcasting for me is that it's an excuse to meet other people and jump out of my disciplinary and departmental and even uh, regional silo and connect with people um, by talking to them in spaces like this and in podcasts. So we're very glad that you're here. Um, the plan is to have a brief interview and then to open it up for a conversation with people in the room, whether that's in chat or you're very welcome to, when we get to that point, unmute yourself and join us on camera, whatever you're able to and feel comfortable doing. Um, I will introduce myself <laughs> since I've just been talking without telling you who I am. Um, I am Laura Perry. I'm the Assistant Director for Research and Public Engagement at the Center for Humanities at WashU in St. Louis. And I got my PhD at UW-Madison where I was the managing editor of the EdgeFX podcast, which is how I got into podcasting. And uh, I will turn it over to Maggie at this point. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maggie. I'm a third year PhD student at MIT uh, in a program called History, Theory, and Criticism of Art and Architecture, and also um, in the Aga Khan program for Islamic Architecture. Um, yeah, and I think, I think I'm going to talk about my podcast um, separately a little bit later. So I'll just um, leave it at that for now. Awesome. Um, yeah, so that is my first question, <laughs> Maggie, to you, is uh, tell us about your podcast. What's the subject? What's the format? And who, especially who do you imagine as the audience? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my podcast is called Digital Nomads. So I guess I should, in my introduction of myself, I should expand um, on what my research interests are academically. Um, so my Dissertation um, is focused on um, the nomadic pastoralist Bedouin people in the Middle East and specifically on their use of architecture and their relationship to architecture, um, specifically in the British colonial period um, in the Middle East. Um, and so uh, coming to this topic from a background of uh, my sort of previous background is in art history. Um, so coming into a topic where I study nomadic peoples and their histories and cultures, which is a, a sort of area of study that is typically much more situated in anthropology, um, just something that I don't really have any formal training in. Um, I was just, you know, when I was embarking on studying this topic, um, I was just kind of casting around for other resources to learn about nomadism and the history of nomad, nomads in different contexts, in addition to, you know, the scholarly literature that I would have to read anyways, but I was looking for, you know, more kind of accessible pop culture um, type media and sort of coming up very short. Uh, and really like what I wanted was a podcast about the history of nomads and nomadic peoples around the world, sort of from different angles, from different perspectives, and that did not exist. And so I just was like, well, maybe I should 
make that. Um, so that's what I did. Um, so yeah, so the podcast is called Digital Nomads. I've been doing it uh, for almost two years. I started in January 2021. This was my like um, COVID lockdown project. You know, people, everybody else was making sourdough. I was uh, figuring out how to make a podcast. Um, and the format is primarily interviews. Um, I mostly interview um, other academics, uh, professors from a wide variety of disciplines, not just anthropology, but I've interviewed um, geographers, historians, people in communication studies, um, so sort of all over the academic realm, but I've also done interviews um, with activists, artists, politicians who in some way who are themselves from nomadic or indigenous backgrounds um, and who in some way sort of work on um, uh, representing the rights of nomadic peoples um, in the current world. Um, yeah, so that's the format is primarily interviews. I've done a little bit of just kind of solo episodes where I just kind of talk from a script um, about content um, related to my own research, but primarily it's um, interview based. And the audience that I imagine, um, I mean, I, there's maybe a difference between my ideal audience and the audience that I actually have. I would like to think that it's accessible to a wide audience and I would like to think that it's the sort of thing that is um, accessible to and listen to sort of anyone who is broadly interested in history. Um, so that's sort of how I position it is that if you are interested in any other podcast about history, if you're interested in world history, just in general, then this is something that you would be interested in because that's sort of the approach that I'm taking is that when you like, at whatever point I'm done with the podcast, if it's ever done, that somebody could look at that kind of at my like back catalog and could, and that it could function as kind of a world history, but through the lens of the nomadic peoples of the world. So kind of flipping how um, we typically approach the study of world global history as being kind of focused on empires and the kind of great civilizations. Um, so that's who I would like to think my audience is, is really just anyone who is even slightly interested in history. Um, in reality, I think my audience um, is largely academics. Um, and a little bit, um, uh, a little bit, I think of what I'm trying to target, which are just kind of lay people who are interested in history, um, and have kind of found their way to my podcast through whatever means. Um, but I would say just the, because I mostly interview academics, um, I think that is generally the audience. Um, that I've found is um, people who are in some way themselves doing research that connects to um, the study of nomadic peoples. But yeah. I love the way you put it as, uh, and I'm sure this is going to be a great way to put it for your own research when you're like selling your, <laughs> your, your dissertation as an important project, but just that flipping of global history as not concerned with stable geographically bounded institutions and entities but really seeing it as um about uh flows and changes and and that kind of migration of of nomadic people that's really cool um and it does seem like a podcast where you can kind of um move between stories more readily than you know chapters or like the confines of an academic uh, format would kind yes. of lend itself to being able to show the different layers of those many stories as they intersect with each other. Exactly. Yeah. How often does it come out? I aim for once a month. Okay. That's great. about all I yeah. have time for. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so let's 
pause and, well, not pause exactly. Uh, let's add in, in a new person um, to our trio. Um, so why don't um, you introduce yourself and then I will ask you the question that I just asked Maggie and then we can get rolling. Um, and we're very delighted that you are able to be here after overcoming some technical issues. Thank you so much. Again, I'm so sorry. I apologize for being late. It's so good to be here with you all and um, to be here at this symposium. So my name is Leah Rubinsky, and I am a sixth year PhD candidate at the University of Washington, where I'm working in the comparative literature department. Um, and I just sort of stumbled upon podcasting, maybe like many of you did as well. Um, something that I've always loved, you know, like go for a walk, listen to a podcast, right? Um, but then I had an interesting moment that shifted things for me where I got to think, wow, maybe I can actually use podcasting in the classroom, in my teaching, and then, whoa, maybe I could use it as part of my dissertation. Maybe I can make a podcast. So <laughs> It was kind of that order of things that kind of led me um, to do that. So tell us about your podcast. Um, what is the subject and, and who are you imagining that you're making your podcast for? Absolutely. So my podcast, it's called Grad Share. It's very much a homemade podcast. Um, just putting that out there. I'm not great at audio production <laughs> or things like that, um, but it's an interview-based podcast. And what I wanted to do with it is really, I was having a lot of um, challenges in graduate school. I don't know if anyone else can relate to that, but um, so I wanted to explore issues of equity and access in graduate school and basically try to find answers to questions that I was having that, that were coming up, you know, topics that I, I wasn't feeling like I was getting a lot of support around um, things like graduate school and mental health issues, graduate school and um, alt-ac careers, for example, um, things like that. So, so it's an interview-based podcast. I have just, I feel really honored to have talked to a lot of different folks who have, um, you know, like mental health advocates talking to me about graduate school and mental health, um, different faculty members, professors, folks who have gotten PhDs are now working outside of the academy, things like that, um, just, to, just to have more conversations about different facets of graduate school that I, that I had these questions to that I wasn't getting a bunch of answers to. So, um, so really with that said, my imagined audience is fellow graduate students, I would say. Um, but also kind of more recently, I'm thinking, you know, it'd be great also if administrators, faculty members, people who care about supporting grad students, <laughs> you know, might be also interested in, in some of the things we're talking about. Yeah, and hearing it directly from grad students um, via that podcast, absolutely. Um, so this is a question for both of you. Um, so why have a podcast as a graduate student? You're already busy enough. Uh, and what are, what are some of the challenges and the benefits of being a podcaster while in grad school as you're both doing? Uh, I can start. Um, so for me, um, well, maybe I think this relates to a lot of what Leo was just saying about the challenges of being a graduate student. Um, this is maybe something I should not admit to on a recording, uh, but I will anyways. I, I would have dropped out of my PhD program if it were not for starting my podcast, actually. Um, and I think that is because it just, it gave me something that is kind of entirely mine um, and it allows me to explore my academic interests in a way where I completely set the parameters and I set my own expectations and my own deliverables and it's just I'm I'm in charge and I don't have to worry about you know feedback from my advisor I don't have to worry about 
you know, does peer reviewer number two not like my journal article? You know, I it's just I completely do it for myself. Um, and I think being able to take that kind of control over your work and your kind of it's not exactly an academic output, but because the topic of my podcast is related to my academic research, um, I find it just gives me just more kind of, I feel like at least like I have more agency over what I'm doing. And that in turn, I think has allowed me to like throughout the pro throughout the whole timeline of being in graduate school has allowed me throughout this process just to kind of stay to stay passionate I guess about what I'm doing um to stay curious um to keep exploring sort of outside of like the somewhat narrow discipline um that I am in um yeah so without like getting too corny over here about the miracles of podcasting um for me, it's been an incredible tool or just a really valuable side project um, to have while I've been doing my PhD. Um, and I think it has been something that has allowed me to at least tolerate um, some of the challenges of academia and of doing a PhD in the humanities. Um, I mean, there are obviously challenges that come with doing it, like, you know, the fact that we are all busy, we have a lot of other demands on our time. It's not something that I feel like I can always prioritize as much as I would like, because at the end of the day, I get paid by my institution to do other things. Um, so I do have to prioritize those. Um, but actually, I've found that sort of for my own, like, mental health, I do sort of have to prioritize um, my podcast. So that's kind of just like a choice that I make in my life and in how I organize my time in graduate school is that, you know, maybe instead of um, doing a conference paper, maybe I, I choose to spend more time on my podcast instead. And I, I just find that that has what's worked best for me and I think has allowed me to um yeah to kind of survive um as long as I have it's so interesting that Maggie you use the word um well actually just you're talking about if not for podcasting you might have dropped out of your program and I can actually a thousand percent relate to that um podcasting just having this side project of podcasting, it's it's a creative public facing medium that you can experiment with. So if you're like me, which is to say <laughs> a little bit burnt out as a graduate student <laughs> who's maybe disillusioned, I would say, with some of the more traditional academic formats, podcasting is is a different medium. It's it's accessible in a way that a lot of academic publications might not be. Um, and also podcasting as a graduate student can be a way um, for you to do the things that you want to do, maybe in ways that align more with your values, if you're into public facing scholarship, or if you're into public facing knowledge and that kind of thing. I also want to say that I really feel like podcasting has helped me find my voice. So not just with this side project of um, just kind of helping me get through graduate school by exploring problems in graduate school. Um, but also I'm, I'm trying to incorporate podcasting, like to do a podcast facet of um, my dissertation actually. And that has been immensely helpful for me to find my voice. Cause I feel like in my case, um, so I, I'm, I grew up, you know, I'm, I'm a Latinx woman. I grew up you know, bilingual and that kind of thing. But for me, there was always this weird divide of where Spanish is in the home and English is at school. So this kind of dichotomy is created where it's like, I come to kind of value English and English is what my academics are in and English. And now I'm in a place where even though my scholarship right now is on Colombian women writers, 
I, when I go to sit down and write my dissertation, which is in a traditional writing format, I, I feel that I'm writing in a voice that is not mine. I feel that I'm writing in this sort of formal academic English that the traditional academic genre of writing privileges, right? And so with the podcast um, element of my dissertation that I'm doing, I feel more free to bring in different languages, to code switch, to have different accents, to, and it's just, it's really helped me um, feel like I'm writing my work or, or feel like I, it's not even writing, right? I'm like voicing through the podcast <laughs> myself in a way that feels maybe more authentic than what I could do in writing. Um, I echo Maggie though, there's time is always, you know, I spend way too much time at editing the podcast, you know, <laughs> and, and it's fun to do. So that's good. But as graduate students, we don't have unlimited time. Right. And so, um, so that's always a challenge, uh, but kind of thinking through it and, and balancing and, and knowing that it is really helpful in many ways for me. I hear so many resonances between what you both shared and my own reasons for getting into podcasting. So um, I, I think there must come a moment for many grad student podcasters when the boundaries of academic writing and um, not even just writing, but also uh, expectations and milestones and, and hoops. Like there's a moment when grad school just seems like a series of endless hoops that you didn't get to design and that are maybe shrinking or becoming more, you know, on fire or slippery or like whatever your metaphor is of what's happening to the hoops. Uh, and thinking about podcasting as something that um, doesn't have all of those externally imposed hoops and how uh, freeing that can be even as you're suddenly figuring out how to delete an air conditioning hum from the background of, of audio and all the frustrations that come with that. Um, so uh, you've already addressed some of this um, in your responses, but I'm curious about how you think of your podcast relating to the topic of your grad studies. And um, also, you know, has your podcast influenced how you approach those studies or approach research or approach teaching, you know, has podcasting taught you anything about um, the rest of that academic life, even as it offers an escape from it in some ways? Another question for both of you. Um, yeah, so I would love to hear more from Leia about um, the podcast aspect of her dissertation, because I think that's really fascinating. And that's something that I have been thinking about potentially doing or trying to do, but I have not quite been sure how, or I guess it feels like the kind of thing where if I were to do that, I kind of feel like somebody needs to give me permission for that, uh, because it is just a little bit of a, you know, non-traditional thing. Um, so I kind of feel like somebody, like I need a template or I need something, or I need somebody to tell me like, hey, this is a thing that you could, that you could do, like, that's okay. Um, so I would love to hear more about that. Um, uh, in my own research, I mean, yeah, um, so I think doing my podcast has allowed me, um, I think it encourages me to read much more widely than I would otherwise, and to, um, I think, to think sort of more expansively about what types of media, what types of literature, what types of art and artifacts can kind of qualify as scholarly. Um, so I use, I think, much more sort of activist rhetoric um, and frameworks in my dissertation than I would otherwise, and then I think is sort of typical in a historical dissertation, and that has come out of the conversations that I've had um, on my podcast and as a result of like people that I've met through my podcast who are um, activists and representatives for um, the rights of nomadic peoples today. So that uh, has been very fruitful for me. 
Um, and yeah, also I, I definitely do use podcasting as a teaching tool in all of my classes. I always either assign podcasts as an alternative to reading and that always generates an incredible response. So I encourage everyone to do that in some way in your syllabi if you aren't already. Um, and I often do sort of podcasting assignments um, with students instead of the more traditional, like write a 10 page paper. Um, and I think uh, working at, at MIT where students are very into technology um, and they are all already better like audio engineers and producers than I am. You just like naturally, even if they've never done it before, um, I think yeah, giving students assignments that are create a podcast, you know, interview somebody and just record your conversation, just things like that um, are always extremely well received. And so I would never, I would never go back to the sort of more traditional um, reading assignments of, you know, read this 30 page article, write this 10 page paper on a given topic. Um, yeah, I think just use it, using that format in the classroom, um, I think makes, makes the classroom experience much more collaborative. Um, I think it's a great way to teach students listening skills in particular, um, when you encourage students to do interviews as like, in, to do like interview sort of podcasts. Um, I've seen just like how through that process, students become better at listening um, to their peers, at asking critical questions, at sort of deeply engaging with source material. Um, so yeah, that has been um, another sort of positive um, outcome for me. And I, I do wanna get to what Maggie was asking about the dissertation element of my, sorry, the podcasting element of my dissertation. But before that, I'll just say that um, I think that, well, so podcasting absolutely relates to my research, my dissertation work, because I work in Caribbean and Colombian women's writing. You know, the Caribbean, circum Caribbean region absolutely centers storytelling as methodology. And so, and it's a big part of what you can do in podcasting is, is sort of like um, a more intimate space of, of storytelling in many cases. So I think, I think there's a direct connection there. And then um, just responding to your uh, question, Maggie, it's, it's a kind of a work in progress. I, let me tell you who inspired me though, because it might be interesting for anybody who is curious about podcasts and dissertations, but I stumbled upon a, uh, a podcast by Anna Williams, which was actually, and I'll drop it into the chat. Anna Williams is the first person to do her dissertation completely in a podcast format. So she successfully defended it, um, you know, created it, defended it. And the podcast is phenomenal. It's called My Gothic Dissertation. Um, yeah. I, I was at a postdoc at University of Iowa, so I, I, I got there and everyone was like, podcast dissertation. It was so, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she is, it's just, it's fabulous. It's a wonderful, and she, the interesting thing too is it's not just a podcast about her dissertation, but it's a podcast about her struggles to convince her committee that this is what she needed to do. So <laughs> it's really interesting on many levels. Um, in terms of my own dissertation, what I'm doing, and it's, it is, it's a struggle to kind of, I mean, like you were saying, Maggie, podcasting is so new. Um, well, not really new, but alternative dissertations are, are, you know, maybe don't have the legitimacy yet that they, that they could hopefully have soon or in the future. And so it is a struggle to, to convince your committee, I think sometimes, but um, what I'm doing is I'm doing a sort of some traditional chapters. And then what I'm doing is turning those chapters and the work of my dissertation and my research into, um, into a podcast. So just like a couple of episodes to really communicate what I'm trying to do and also to bring in voices. Um, I did a lot of great ethnographic work that I wanna feature. Um, and so, so that's really what, what I'm doing with, with mine. So, 
we were supposed to keep our remarks to about half an hour. So I have one final question for you both until we uh, throw it open to um, talk with the people who have joined us today. And I'm really excited to um, hear from them. And we did actually brainstorm some questions for you all in the audience that we're curious to know your answers to. So after I ask them this question, I'll throw it open to Q&A that any of the audience members might have for um, our two panelists over here, but also we are curious to brainstorm collectively with you all. Um, so with that sneak preview of what's coming, uh, I'm curious how podcasting has influenced your career, either practically, you know, if there are professional opportunities that you've been able to take advantage of because of your um, interests and skills in podcasting, or, uh, you know, in your ideas of next steps and what is coming next for you after graduate school. So Maggie, why don't you take it away? Yeah, so I think practically, um, one of the biggest sort of values of um, my podcast for me has been the kind of networking, um, you know, and so if you are like me, and you are somebody who is who sort of dreads the, you know, coffee hour at conferences where you just like, <laughs> have to kind of stand around awkwardly and like make small talk and never quite know who to talk to. Um, if that sort of thing is not your ideal, then I highly recommend doing something like a podcast where you interview um, other people in your field who you admire, who you look, you look up to and who you want to get to know because it's such a good way to just to kind of have an excuse to reach out to somebody whose work you like and say, hey, I read your book and I loved it. Do you want to come talk to me about it? And every, like 100% of the time they will say, yes, I have never been ignored. I have never been rejected. Like everybody loves talking about their work um, and everybody loves feeling like, you know, everybody loves having like a fangirl like me out there who wants to talk to them about it. Um, so it's been amazing in that sense, in terms of feeling like I'm building kind of a, a community of people who I know on a kind of deeper level, which is hard to do as a graduate student to actually like get to know kind of senior academics. Um, and yeah, so I feel like I have people now at universities all over the world who know me and sort of know my work um and that's I think a very valuable just like thing to have um both currently and eventually when I go out on the job market whatever happens with that um in terms of my future career I um I don't I don't think I can really answer that in a very satisfying way at the moment, just because I don't know what I actually want to do when I am done with this. Um, but either way, I think um, I think, like I said before, it's given me just sort of more freedom to imagine a career outside of the kind of traditional academic you know, a trajectory um, where now I feel, I feel like I can imagine a future where once I graduate, I can use my PhD for kind of public humanities type work um, if that is something that I choose to do. And I feel like I have, you know, I at least have developed something of a skill set in that and I sort of have the confidence to feel like that is something that I could achieve. So it's been empowering in that regard to at least be able to imagine a future for myself that is not necessarily on that very linear academic track because realistically for a lot of us, we will not actually be able to follow that path. Cool. Um, I 
I resonate with a lot of that as well. Um, so uh, Leia's internet is proving tough. So we will hope that she is able to join us later. But um, for now, I wanted to open it up to the audience. And um, before we uh, jump in to talking with you, I'm curious if any of you have any questions for, for Maggie or for me, I'm also happy to answer any questions. Um, and uh, I know Dan dropped one in the chat a while back. Um, and so Maggie, maybe you can uh, address this directly. Uh, how has podcasting changed the way you approach traditional ideas of quote unquote primary research material? Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's changed the way I approach traditional ideas of what one can do with primary research material. So my primary research material is um, in my field, either archival um, research or like archival documents and um, buildings. Um, and the latter um, is sort of difficult to talk about in a podcast format in my experience I think there are a lot of I mean there are a lot of amazing podcasts that work with kind of material culture and work with visual objects and artifacts and things like that um but personally I have not quite figured out how to actually sort of face that challenge of how to talk about sort of visual things in a audio format um so that is something that I'm hoping to explore more and to kind of do more of but in terms of how I use, like, it's changed, I think, how I do, like, archival research, because I think um, just, like, having some experience with podcasting has changed sort of what I look for when I do archival research and has changed my ideas of sort of what, like, what is worth pulling out from the archives, you know, because um, I think I look and I think just like my brain has kind of shifted in terms of the stories that I look for and the pieces of information that I look for and how I sort of see things as potentially becoming stories in a certain that kind of podcast audio format in a way that I wouldn't, I don't think I would see that if I was only thinking for my like written, you know, standard for chapter dissertation. So I think it's changed maybe not my ideas of what primary research material is, but how I approach that primary research material, if that makes sense. It does. That's also a phrase that I love editing out of people when they're on a podcast. They give this great well-crafted, totally understandable answer. And then I just go, I highlight it. I X. know it's not necessary. <laughs> and yet I say it anyways, but. Um, so people in the audience, uh, we would love to hear from you either if you have your own podcast that you want to recommend, or if you have another grad student podcast that you want to recommend, we're going to compile a list and hopefully uh, share it out afterwards and maybe do some featuring of them on our social media for HPN. Um, but we also really wanted to think about um, how graduate schools and universities can better support grad student podcasting. So we'd love to hear from you any success stories of grad schools supporting grad student podcasting, or you know, if you are a grad student podcaster, something that you would really need, something that you would love if your university would provide for you. Um, and I think this question, you know, it felt urgent to me when I was a grad student trying to make it work, but it also now, especially in my role where I am supporting uh, grad student research and grad student uh, public facing projects, you know, this is something that I hope to try to do at my own university um, going forward in my role in the Center for the Humanities. So would really hope to uh, hear from you all in the audience any any uh, 
podcast recommendations or any ideas that you have about how grad school can be more friendly to student podcasters. Welcome back, Leah. Glad to have you. Well, while you were all thinking about it, um, I will ask Leia the question that I was going to ask you before your internet rudely interrupted us, which is, um, how has podcasting influenced your career, um, either practically, you know, professional opportunities that are connected to podcasting, or in your ideas about next steps? Yeah, so I am... Um sort of always thinking about alt act jobs, I think. Um, and so podcasting really opened the door to me that if I can really work on developing this sort of skill set related to podcasting, so not just, you know, audio production. And again, I'm my podcast is very homemade. So it's not like I'm an expert uh, at audio recording or production skills or anything, but, but, you know, honing those skills a little bit, if I can, um, you know, hone the skills of, of marketing the podcast and things like that, then maybe I can also kind of consider a little bit more expansively jobs outside of academia, jobs like, for example, communications, jobs in communications, um, and, and in that realm. So it has kind of, it has made me think about differently about the possibilities, the career possibilities after the, the PhD, after academia. Um, yeah. Yeah. So for both of you, uh, have you seen any success stories of your institution supporting grad student podcasting? Have your advisors been okay with you spending your time this way? Have you found community with other people on campus who are excited that this is something that you're doing while in grad school? Or maybe even more practically, like when I was a grad student recording a podcast, I used the student radio station. I borrowed fancy microphones from the digital media library. Uh, so there are all kinds of ways that you can, um, you know, just because you're on a college campus, uh, maybe have a leg up um, because of the resources there. So I'm curious if that has proved true for the two of you. Um, I would say it's been mixed in my experience, um, like general. So generally, just the fact that I'm doing this podcast has been very well received by faculty, uh, which is great. It was actually, I was a little concerned about that, um, but I was pleasantly surprised by how enthusiastic um, my advisors and, you know, professors were. That being said, I think they do just see it as kind of a hobby, um, and I think I have some work still to do to kind of convince them of the scholarly utility. Um, so I think, you know, I love what Leah said about her dissertation, dissertation slash podcast. Um, I would love to do something like that. I think, as Leah also said, it would take a lot of work to convince my committee to be on board with anything like that. Um, so yeah, of course, just kind of breaking down those kind of entrenched notions among the kind of old guard of academia around what is possible, what is valid, what is kind of legitimate scholarship is still like, I think something that we all still need to work on. Um, in terms of practic sort of practical like equipment and logistics, um, I have really had a surprisingly hard time with this at MIT, um, including like when I teach with podcasts in the classroom, it's always really difficult just to get equipment, just to get like enough microphones and headsets for students to get them like licenses for um, editing software and things like that. That's all that's incredibly difficult. Um, I actually I started my podcast uh, when I was living in Helsinki um, and I also and I think the reason I was able to start my podcast is because the Helsinki Public Library has amazing, high quality, like audio recording booths that are open to members of the public. And you just check them out. You just like reserve them with your public library card. 
And then you have like, it's, you know, an audio engineer's just absolute dream. So that was really nice. And um, one of many things that the United States of America does not provide um, to members of the public. So yeah, um, I think ideally, you know, like, Laura said, um, I think you would think that college campuses would have resources like that for their students kind of readily available. In my experience, that's unfortunately not always the case. But yeah, so that's been, that's been my sort of mixed experience. That's interesting. I, I would say for me, what resonates for me and what is happening for me in my campus at the University of Washington is, I also don't think there is this view that yet that podcasting is a legit scholarly thing. Um, but what is happening on my campus is there is support for using the podcast medium to translate the work of your, you know, your scholarly work to a more public facing audience. And that's cool, definitely, that that there's a place for that for sure. But I also think that we can we can also understand podcasts as scholarly as well, you know. <laughs> so so that's interesting. Um, that said though, there are some programs on campus that have been offered. There is, for example, I first got some introduction to using Audacity, you know, the open face, uh, open source software that kind of got me into podcasting and, and thinking that I could actually produce one and do one. Um, there's a program out of the library on my campus. It's the UW um, Library Storytellers Program, and it's a podcasting program that, that provides skills to graduate students and undergraduate students who want to work in that medium, so that's really cool. Um, so there is some stuff, and actually one of my pieces of advice was going to be if anyone was curious um, just to, and I, it's, un, it's unfortunate, Maggie, because you were saying that unfortunately on, at MIT, it's not, there's not a whole lot of support in that way. So I was gonna say, you know, for folks try, you know, look for funding on your campus. I have gotten a little bit of funding actually um, through the Simpson Center on my campus. And my avenue for getting that way or going that way has been work looking in digital humanities and doing podcasting in digital humanities. So. There, there can be more funding if you go in that avenue, perhaps, um, although not as much as, as would be, as would be totally helpful for sure. So, so uh, Dan, since you already asked the question, do you mind if I skip you in the order? Excellent. Great. Very gracious. Um, so, uh, Lacey Rubio, would you like to join in? Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for letting me uh, get in first. Hello, um, my name is Lacey. I'm from Cuba. Hola. <laughs> and I'm doing my PhD in Dublin, Ireland. So I'm just in my second year and I'm researching podcasting in Cuba. I was, I was just going to share with you that I know, for example, that the University of Sussex uh, has a very strong media program and they are trying to encourage PhD candidates towards practice based um, projects. And there's this professor, is called Martin Spinelli. He produced um, a series of podcasts with post-grad post students as well. It's called For Your Years Only. And that has also resulted into a um, co-creative space uh, for post-grad students as well. In, in my university, Dublin City University, they have a very, again, strong MA multimedia program, which is very nice to, to be part of and, and now um, doing some labs with MA students and you can see them exploring audition and trying to get an understanding of how sounds work and what are the capabilities that they can and the skills they can also gain doing this program. So again, it's just um, being close with that learning process and, and figuring out how to help them or how to contribute to their learning as well. And and Maggie, um, I think that eventually, as well as Leah, um, you could shape your podcast into a more narrative um, type of podcast and that can um, open the scope 
of your research and and your audience as well because there's a lot of stories to be told and having the voices of those people of this community you are researching um, beyond the analysis and the expertise that your interviewees are already uh, giving you but having the stories of this community um, registered through your podcast can can be a different and more complementary experience of what you're doing so far as well as Leah if you open the scope to other PhD uh, researchers not only in in the US but also in worldwide um, that that contributions and that frustrations that we all share and that the challenges that I think we will face during our whole journey it also nurture the bonding and it gives space for collaborations and each of us have a different skill or different thing to to add to the whole PhD researcher community so so keep going and, and very nice job both of you <laughs> congratulations that was it <laughs> Well, now I'm I'm hoping that Lacey's going to be a future guest on Leia's podcast. <laughs> I, I feel like that was what I just saw happening there. I'd love there. to it's help. I'd love to help. <laughs> I'm actually uh, trying to convince my PhD fellows to um, take part in a different experiment. I wouldn't call it a podcast, although I think it might f fall within the, the concept of podcasting. Hopefully, the... Um, what is a podcast? It's not closed yet, um, and that's that's actually an advantage uh, to take because we can still unravel the podcasting potential, and and it's open to to creative ideas and all sort of approaches. So I'm I'm trying to convince them to write stories and to be part of the writing process, but also of the editing process. So if I convince someone from language school and communication and history to, to be part of this exercise, and if they are excited to take part on it, I think that's already a different uh, way to cope with our research journeys as well. That sounds so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in our in our last couple minutes, I want to brutally skip Dan again, which he will forgive me for doing, um, and go to the question in the chat um, from uh, Cosette. So hi, thanks for this thoughtful discussion. I've really enjoyed the dialogue around opening scholarships last research to broader audiences through podcasting and engaging in public facing scholarship. I have some post production slash accessibility questions, always important. Do you produce and share transcripts of your podcasts, perhaps alongside resources mentioned in the conversation, you know, archival materials, images, et cetera? If so, how or where do you share these? And what other kinds of accessibility considerations do you think about in pre slash post production? And do you receive any support from your library to think through these questions or relatedly copyright slash publishing concerns for your podcast? These are great questions. Um, yes, I do. I do have um, a wonderful couple of people at the library on my campus that I can go to for questions about copyright and, and publishing concerns and that kind of thing. The particular podcast not that I'm working on not related to my dissertation is um, um, doesn't doesn't seem to have sort of issues that copyright issues that are that need to be kind of, that are sticky or need to be kind of picked through or anything like that. Um, in terms of accessibility, uh, that is something that we we are seeing, at least on my campus, thinking a lot more about. I absolutely provide a transcript, yes, with every podcast. Um, I used to type them out myself and then I discovered <laughs> other sort of, um, there's a bunch of transcript kind of, um, software that you can use to help you do that faster. Um, but that that's really important to provide alongside the podcast. Um, I think this is something I'm still, I'm continuing to think about. How can I continue to make sure that at every level, the podcast is as accessible as possible? You know, I think about things like um, all kinds of things, yeah. So the transcript, yes, 
and I'm continuing to think more about about this. Yeah. Yeah, I would echo that. Um, yeah, I also do transcripts um, for each episode, and I um, and I also link things like useful, you know, like images. If I refer to images, I link sort of references for further reading and um, things like that in the show notes of every episode that I do. My concern around that is I like with certain podcasting platforms, like the show, like the kind of UI um, of that is of like how links at like external links appear is I find like not good at all. And so my concern is that depending on what platform people are listening on, that information just kind of get like it gets buried or like the links don't work, like the links aren't actually clickable hyperlinks or whatever. Um, so I mean, but I do try to make that information available um, to the extent that I can. My other, my kind of, one of my big kind of concerns around accessibility, and I think maybe Leia touched on this as well, was around language. Um, so like I applied for funding to do a kind of uh, future podcast series uh, focusing on the community that I work on in the Middle East, on the Bedouin community, that would be doing interviews with members of that community and sort of highlighting their stories. Um, but so then my kind of what, or what I sort of had to deal with when I was applying for this funding was the language because I like the interviews would be in Arabic, everything would be in Arabic, but the funding body wants this in like wants everything to be as wants everything to be accessible to a wider audience. So they wanted everything to be in English or like translated into English. And I think that's I mean, I have a lot of feelings about that, but I don't think that's a good way to go about it. Um, so I sort of had to negotiate around that, like, okay, how do I make this sort of equally accessible? How do I preserve people's original language and stories without kind of like, why does everything have to be translated into English? But then if it stays in Arabic, then that does raise kind of additional challenges for me around like the marketing, um, and how do I, like, I don't know anything about sort of the podcast market in the Middle East. So how do I kind of make sure that 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 those stories are being shared and are kind of being uh, made available to the people that I want them to reach? Like, how do I make sure that this actually has an impact if I'm going to do it? Right. So, yeah, I think, I mean, this I know, like the question of language and podcasting, I know, has been discussed in other places in this symposium. So it's a much larger question. But yeah, that's another one of the like accessibility questions that I'm always kind of, yeah, just having to think about. Great answers, both of you. And it was just such a delight to talk to you both um, and to get to meet you uh, in this context. And I want to invite everyone to drop your feedback in this Google form that I have just dropped in the chat. The Humanities Podcast Network is looking for suggestions and also uh, very open to new members. So if you've enjoyed this and you want to join in on some future conversations, not only in October and November, uh, then, then feel free to join. I also want to invite you all to the future sessions today, including one that is about um, scholarship and podcasting. And so for any of you who are thinking about ways to um, jump across those or maybe deliberately keep them separate in your life because you don't want your university getting their hands on any of your IP. Um, I, Dan's nodding because I know that's part of his attitude. Uh, you know, that, that uh, it's a really lively conversation in the HPN group and I'm sure it promises to be a great session. So um, yeah, thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, and hope to see you either on Zoom or in Gather or, you know, run into you in some future in-person conference. And yeah, feel free to drop your links and your emails in the chat and I hope to stay in touch.